Okay, welcome everyone. Um, thanks for being here. Now, let me just bring up my files. So this is uh, normally, if I was doing this face to face, uh, as it were, I would ask if anybody was new to a round table and then, and then, and then I'd launch into the same thing anyway. So I don't know why I even worry about asking that. Um, Cause I always say, look, this is a, this is the LCT round table, welcome. And what happens here is all kinds of things. Um, uh, and uh, Mauricio or Paz, if you could, uh, Yes, pretty brilliant people are turning off their video, great. So yes, the round table, which is now online. And at this time, um, on this day, um, on Thursdays at four, to enable more people from around the planet to join in. Um, now the round table, we're still feeling our way, finding our way on, a, on this sort of new online format. But the round table is always um, traditionally been a space in which all kinds of different sorts of things can be done. So from finished PhDs summarizing what they're doing or trying to get everything into an hour uh, to people who've very just begun their work or, or, or looking for insights and suggestions and engagement with ideas from major studies to small studies from highly theoretical papers that are uh, setting out, for example, um, a translation device for a new mode or, or for a new concept or something like that to very practical papers about um, teaching. So it's always been a very, uh, it's, it's the LCT's round table now online is, um, is held together, its coherence is the LCT, but what it's about, how it's about beyond that um, and how it's run is entirely up to the presenters. And I do encourage different kinds of modes and I'm going happy to say that today is going to be um, uh, a bit different to our uh, usual um, kind of sort of talks and, and questions and so on. So that's great because it involves getting your hands, um, not dirty, but getting engaged with everything. Uh, now, I traditionally also don't introduce anybody beyond saying that today's roundtable is um, by uh, Jane Thwaite and uh, Paul Curzon and what jolly good people they are too. But I just let the people themselves introduce themselves and the only other thing I do before I then shut up and let you get on is just remind people of what's coming up they are on are they on the website yet Mauricio no not yet but they will be on the website um, and also sent around by email um, and that's in two weeks Susie uh, the 17th of September uh, Susie Cowley Hasselton um, will be from Warwick University um, and the 1st of October, it's myself and Jaegen. And then 22nd of October, so there's a bit of a gap, is Kareen Wolf. And then 5th of November is Lee Rushniak. And 19th of November, Jack Walton. And that's going to be a real mixture of international, national, uh, sorry, different nationalities, different topics, different theories, different parts of the theory, I should say. Um, and from very abstract to very hands on, very uh, practical. So just look and check out those things and now I will just hand it over to Jane and Paul who will just carry it from here. Uh, the only thing I will say is that Paul and Jane are you um, okay with people just jumping in and asking questions at any time? Yeah definitely just just pile in interrupt me. Excellent so I think Ask it. what happened before is that we would allow I would say to everybody just jump in and ask a question at any moment um, and don't have to wait until right at the end if you do want to ask a question. And then when we first started this, we were very wary about the bandwidth. Everybody was piling onto Zoom and the whole thing collapsed when there was more than like three people on it. But now I think we're fairly, <laughs> fairly okay. So just unmute yourself, um, um, Paz, I assume that people can do that. And if they can't, can you make it so? Thank you. Yes. Um, okay. Just brilliant. So unmute yourself, jump in and ask a question at any time. You don't have to wait until the end. Okay, I shall now uh, shut up. The other okay. thing I'd say is if you're a little bit shy, because maybe you feel nervous to do that, in the Google Doc, we've got a section called questions and comments. So if you think of something and think, oh, but I'm not, I'm not quite ready to jump in, then you can pop it into the questions and comments area and we will pick that up as we go along as well. So you've got multiple methods. Brilliant. And, and you... that's excellent. You can also put it in the chat if you want to as well. So... I'll let right. you go now. I'll shut up. Bye-bye.
Okay, I'm going to start, I guess, but we'll just introduce ourselves quickly first. So I'm Paul Curzon. I'm actually a computer scientist, professor of computer science at Queen Mary University of London. Um, and I've, well, I've been interested in LCT and semantic waves for a couple of years when Jim Donner, who basically pointed me at it and I just came across it and thought, wow, that explains everything I do. And not only individually, it explains a whole bunch of separate things I do. I could see how it kind of linked lots of things together. So this, so I'm co-presenting with Jane, who can introduce herself just in a moment, but it's also worked essentially with Jim, who pointed me in the right direction in the first place. And then ultimately Carl was kind enough to chip in and actually help us get started on some of the stuff we did. So over to Jane briefly to just introduce introduce herself. Oh, hi, I'm Jane Waite. I'm also obviously at Queen Mary University of London and um, Paul is my professor so I'm doing a PhD there and I'm interested in semantic waves because Paul introduced me to semantic waves and then um, Carl has been very kind to kind of help us along the way and that's it for me. Okay, so the first thing for people who've just arrived and didn't gather this so if you look on this title slide the stuff in red is we're actually using a collaborative document so we'll do some activities and try and get some discussion actually there as well as online so for shy people who don't like to dive in or if you want to ask questions without interrupting then add them there and we'll pick them up and if you put them there then also we can sort of add written answers to things later if we don't actually get to all the questions. Um, the Google Doc we found gives a good way of organizing questions and answers because in chat things disappear before you manage to have seen them. Um, so if it's something you want us definitely to see then try the Google Doc as a place to put it but do feel free to just pile in. The other thing is We've suggested having pencil and paper handy. Um, you might need that for something Jane's going to do in a moment. Also, there is a magic trick I'm going to do part way through that's a quick trick. And in the Google Doc, it gives you a link to it. It's probably a bit late to do this now unless you really have a printer directly handy. But if you want to, you can print that either now or later and cut it out and you can actually do the magic trick yourself. Um, so well, there'll be a chance for you to do the magic trick. If you don't have a chance to do that, then you can passively watch an online version of it at the same time as other people are trying it out. But that's all in the Google Doc, which is at this bit.ly link, LCT set. Okay, so what's all this about? Essentially, it's a case study this is very practical it's not at all theoretically i wouldn't say we've added anything to lct at all um we're just applying all the stuff everybody else has done and carl's been pointing us in the right direction when we've been getting confused about things um and essentially what we're looking at is semantic profiles applying that to our working computer science and computer science education um so i've been using it in a whole bunch of different ways. One of the early things was I've been struggling for 20 years to teach my first year undergraduates to explain things, both in exam questions and to each other. So that was one of the initial things that I just realized, oh, this gives me a really quick and simple way to explain something I'd been trying to explain to them about essentially following a wave of a very simple wave of what an, an explanation looks like that I would give high marks to as opposed to what everybody was writing which was bullet point non-explanations. So we've been analyzing our own activities and there's a whole bunch of published papers about that and that's a lot of what I'll be talking about. We've also been introducing semantic waves to teachers and organizations in the UK and elsewhere doing um, professional development and developing resources and so we've been giving talks to teachers CPD talks for teachers I've been doing this for, for several years um, and just teachers that we tell about this just tend to be incredibly enthusiastic so there's a lot of people have been using this idea just as a way of thinking about their teaching and improving it 
but also there's a lot of work in the UK at the moment developing a new curriculum resources for schools and the organization doing that or several organizations have been starting to use semantic waves both them popularizing it to other people but also including it in the way they develop the material they're developing both online and their teacher cpd resources they're using semantic profiles and semantic waves to think about how to improve what they're doing and one of the things we've done most recently is just outline some simple steps that teachers can use to actually um, quickly and easily uh, improve their lesson plans and that's based on semantic profile so that that's roughly the things that we've been doing so it's all really practical just taking the ideas that are out there and just trying them out and finding they work really well in our particular discipline and there's particular reasons why it really, really fits closely that I'll, I'll talk about in a moment to, to the kind of things we do. So, oops. For some reason, my slides aren't moving on properly. I'm going to switch back to this mode so I can see what I'm doing. Um, so, a good learning experience according to LCT follows some kind of wave like this. So Carl suggested I should give a brief intro introduction to what it's all about in case there were newbies here. What I'm going to do is give a very non-technical version of this. So I don't claim to have mastered the terminology of LCT whatsoever. I have to think really hard about what density and gravity, semantic density and gravity mean before I say anything about it. So I'll probably get totally confused if I start trying to use the terminology. Um, Sorry, Paul, I, I don't think you're alone on that. I think, uh, I think there's a lot of people that like curse about the naming, of things. <laughs> but I, um, but I mean, uh, I think one of the things is that, you know, like, um, uh, uh, just to sort of jump in here for a second is that, you know, we do have this stuff that's very abstract and complex sounding and condensed and so on that I know that, you know, certain people I find very, very difficult or, or, or annoying. Um, but it's that, that has a, you know, that we, we, I know you know this, but I'm just saying this for a general point, which is that that stuff up there is really valuable because that's what brings us all together. Um, yeah. But without these, this kind of work that you're doing, sort of like, you know, saying, oh, it's just not adding anything to LCT. It does. It makes, it adds the raison d'etre to LCT. It adds a purpose and a, and a point to it. I mean, if it was just up here doing nothing, then it would be a complete waste of time. But actually, because mm. of these things like your work, it, you know, it has a purpose to it. So I, I don't see it as not adding anything to LCT as a community well, in the field. We're not, we're not adding theoretically. I'm not. I don't think, but anyway, um, because I've been trying to present this to teachers, I've, I've been trying to find easy ways to explain what it's about without uh, having to take people deep into any kind of theory or terminology. So they don't actually have to master the discipline of LCT with it, but still can just use it. Um, anyway, so the idea of what makes a good explanation you basically have something that's hard to understand that you're trying to teach people that's abstract, technical, it's up in the clouds. And that's what we're trying to explain or give a learning experience to help people understand. You basically unpack that by explaining it in terms of more concrete things and more everyday language. So you get down to some very concrete grounded level and that might be using examples, diagrams, metaphors, similes, um, getting it away from the technical language saying it's like a something or other and that's things that are easy to understand but what you then need to do is then link that back up to the abstract ideas rather than just dropping down into this everyday language what you want people to get ultimately is mastery of these abstract concepts they have to be able to work up in the clouds as well as down in the solid stuff so it's a process of unpacking taking people down but then a good learning experience takes people back up and gives them a chance to link back to the abstract ideas and that's basically the core of the things we've been using i first saw this diagram jim jim talked me through this and i just thought wow that explains so many different things that i've 
kind of taught for myself over 30 years and not quite really worked out why it works but I seem to be doing something a bit like that and several different things like teaching computer science and teaching writing I, it just matches things that I was thinking and just gave me so much clarity and I started to draw links and be able to see better things that I could do transferring from one kind of thing I was doing to another um, so that's where I started anyway there's also bad experiences you can give so if you sort of plot so this is sort of a learning experience over time across the bottom and then how hard and easy the things you're talking about to understand are so bad experiences you can flatline people so university lectures tend to flatline people high they they stay abstract they stay technical they want you to have mastery of the language so that's all the over talk in the technical language and that gives a bad experience you can also flatline low and this is what a lot of people get wrong when they try and teach the way i teach i think they don't link properly to the technical language and the abstract concepts so they do things every in metaphors and everyday language and people i'd made this mistake very clearly in some of my first lectures i ever gave and afterwards i got student feedback saying but why was he teaching us about that because i thought we were learning about computer science and that was because i didn't follow the, the kind of wave structure i went down into concrete examples and never really link back to the things we were learning in everyday metaphors and so on and then other things you can get wrong is if you just do down escalators you never link people back before you go on to the next subject so that's the sort of general thing about what it's all about and when i've been teaching teachers essentially i've been talking them through these diagrams and then giving them concrete examples so why computer science is a good thing for this well one thing is interesting why is it interesting because it's a very mixed discipline um, if you talk to a computer scientist they might might actually think of themselves as a mathematician or a scientist or an engineer or a linguist or a social scientist or they might even think of themselves as a computer science we're a massive mix of people from all over the place who talk completely different languages and do things in completely different ways which makes life very interesting especially when you're doing research the other thing that makes it interesting is it's a form undergraduate subject that's now being taught at primary school worldwide so i teach introductory programming to undergrads and i've made a career of that for 25 30 years and now instead of that being taught to undergraduates we're teaching it to five-year-olds and upwards so not all at once but the whole subject has been moved down into school right the way down to the lowest primary school le level but without a lot of experience of how to teach down at that level and then there's also a dearth of theoretically underpinned pedagogy you know how do we teach especially computing concepts people focus a lot on the skill of programming for example and how to teach that but don't think about the conceptual side of it so you can teach people a programming language but they don't actually understand really in depth what we're doing and what we're trying to do is teach people how to program not a particular language um, and so that is something really important about concepts why teach concepts or how do you teach concepts and i think lct gives us some good traction on ways to do that it's also interesting that it involves both skills and very deep conceptual understanding as needed as well as very very practical skills it's both vocational and theoretical and academic the technical notation we use is very very dense and on top of the normal kind of dense technical notation and terminology you have mastering the words and the concepts we're also about learning new languages so not natural languages but computer languages programming languages so it's learning to read and write a new language and these aren't natural language like things they're mathematically pre precise languages so if you get into the maths you're going even denser than when you're working in the terminology of the programming language and then it's also interesting because it's all this very abstract dense stuff but whatever you write when you write a program that program makes a difference in the world if you're a poet and write a poem the kind of difference it makes in the world is that it might make people happy or sad or make them think you know when we write programs when they actually get going in the world they actually just change the whole way the world works 
Um, and that is very interesting that it's this, this sort of black box invisible stuff, but it has a very, very practical effect on the world. Now this thing about languages, I imagine some of you aren't programmers, most of you aren't programmers, you don't really know what programming is about. Just to give you a glimpse of this, when I say what you're learning a language, um, so this is a very simple little program fragment in a language called Java that I teach. Um, and this is the kind of thing that we expect our students very quickly to learn to read and write. Just in, I can read this like I read English basically. Um, and I can see exactly what it does. It's not what it means, it's also what it does. Um, I've picked out in read one little bit while there's a couple of brackets as well that are in red that are part of this and what does that mean well it's just a word so what does while mean but actually it's more than just a word that means something it does something and this is from wikipedia just to give you an idea of dense meaning so this is a typical way you might explain what a while construct is if you do it in a technical way it's a block of code and a condition an expression and the condition expression is evaluated and if that evaluates to true the code is in the block is executed and that's going to repeat until the condition expression becomes false now if you don't know what any of the things in red mean you haven't got a clue really what a while construct is never mind a vast amount of other stuff that comes along with it that you pick up as you learn to program that's just the basics never mind what it really really means but at one level the <coughs> the word that really matters here is one that I'm putting red it's, it's repeats while is about repeating things and so there's a very simple meaning as well as a very deep meaning to what it's all about so that's the kind of thing we're, we're kind of trying to teach when we're teaching programming for example but I don't want to just give people this I want them to get a very practical understanding and, and actually the skill of using these while constructs so computing I think this is the thing that makes it really interesting. This is what I love about it. Computation happens in the world as well. In everyday contexts, you know, in coffee shops and, and on ships, people moving things around, not in computers, but actually things people are doing. And particularly, I like the fact that it happens in magic shows. I teach computing in schools by giving magic shows and doing very practical things. We do a lot of stuff playing games, doing puzzles, and we're learning computer science concepts we do role play manipulating physical objects in the world and all of this is a way that computing is there but it, the computation the algorithms behind it are still very invisible even though they have major ramifications now this is computation happens in the world whether you know it or not and that gives you a lot of scope for using links to that kind of stuff in the world to what's actually happening invisibly in a box in, in your computer. And this leads to a pedagogy that's really popular, especially in school teaching, called unplugged computing, that Tim Bell and a group in New Zealand actually really, really popularized as a way of teaching computing to, to young primary school kids. And a lot of people do this now, and this is something kind of that's the core of the way I teach. So the idea of unplugged computing is you teach computing away from computers. You just do it in the world with everyday objects and ideas. And it's a really good way of teaching concepts. So you're using analogies, similes, metaphors. You're also role-playing computing. You're doing games and puzzles. You're doing magic tricks. You're setting up mysteries. You're doing storytelling. And it's all about making abstract, intangible ideas, really tangible, really physical and everyday and very fun. And that's the thing that I sort of jumped on that LCT seemed to be exactly talking about um, and giving me a way of understanding why, it, why this might work beyond ways other people have talked about. There are lots of ways you can do uh, unplugged. So I tend to do it because I teach 300, 400 or more, 500 this year apparently, um, people to, to program all at once in a lecture theatre. I tend to do whole class versions of this where I do demonstrations on a stage I in normal times I'm teaching in a theatre on a gigantic theatre stage with a balcony full of students as well as the sort of bottom auditorium full of students so it's very demonstration style getting kids up on the on the stage with me and acting things out but you can use it as a way of just giving explanatory 
lectures like that but you can also do workshop style where the whole class are actually doing things so when i do magic shows with primary school kids we get everybody doing magic um everybody's sort of playing things and you can also do it on an individual levels so one-to-one -one explaining how to write to to students i'm doing individual but you can also we've done lots of science festivals where we just have podiums set up and we just talk to one or two people at once talking them through things so it works in lots of different ways so that's my brief introduction to um, why semantic waves semantic profiling fits what we're doing and what computer science is about i'm now going to hand over to jane to actually give you some more practical stuff of the some of the early things that she did with carl uh, about this so i will now hand over to jane I probably have to stop sharing and let Jane share, so just bear with me a minute. Okay, can, so hello. Can everyone see my screen or not? I can. Well, you can see my screen? Yeah, so hi. Uh, brilliant. Thanks ever so much. So yeah, um, as Paul said, I'm going to do something practical with you. And it links into what Paul said about unplugged computing and obviously a link to semantic waves. And... The objective of the research that I'm going to talk to you about is our aim was to explore semantic waves, as Paul said, as a way to better understand the effectiveness of unplugged computing activities. And to do this by analyzing the profile of a, of a popular unplugged teaching activity. And we're gonna do that actual teaching activity with you. So please get your pencil and, and your paper ready. Now the rationale for our study, um, Paul, explained that unplugged is very popular um, but actually we don't have evidence to explain why sometimes it does work and sometimes it doesn't there's been mixed kind of research results in terms of effectiveness but one of the explanations for the effectiveness of unplugged is that we physically enact it and I'm flinging my arms around and it very much is often with unplugged activities that children and their teachers kind of get out of their chair and they're doing practical things which make we think might make it more memorable and it brings the the active these really um, abstract concepts into a practical and, and concrete context and we're looking to see whether LCT helps us to understand why and how unplugged may or may not work um, and we used a simplified semantic profiling approach, which Carl helped me to do. So Carl and I spent quite a bit of time online uh, going through the lesson plan. And we used um, a case study, so an in-depth analysis of this one particular lesson. And um, the resource that we used is the most popular teaching resource according to the Royal Society and in fact, according to Barefoot themselves, um, that's been used in primary schools at the moment in order to teach about algorithms. And the lesson plan that we chose is called Crazy Characters. And the reason why this is important or is pertinent for me is that I wrote it, but I wrote it an awfully long time ago before I knew anything at all about semantic profiling or semantic waves. So I wrote this lesson plan maybe eight years ago I think maybe is it that long ago um, but now it's become very popular in England to help teachers to teach about computer science so we're going to do crazy characters now so I actually need you to pick up a pen get your piece of paper and I'm going to um, I'm going to help you to start to understand about algorithms and you're going to use algorithms and you're going to debug algorithms so I'm going to that's our learning objective but what I'd like you to do is on a piece of paper I want you to follow these instructions so are you ready I'd like you to draw a body so on your piece of paper with your pen can you draw a body and if you've done that can you give me a thumbs up on your uh, through zoom so that i can see that people have started to do that oh thank you i can start to Is see some thumbs body? up appearing i'm not saying any more so just draw a body and then once you've done that can you add oh let's see two pairs of wings so again give me a thumbs up once you've added those wings
Thank you again, we're getting some thumbs up. Thanks ever so much. Um, then could you add, oh, let's have five legs, an odd number of legs, five legs. Oh, and I'm a primary school teacher if, by trade as well, so I'm bound to have a crown. So could you add a crown as well? And give me a thumbs up when you've added that. People are probably frantically trying to find a piece of paper and a pen at this point. So we've had a body, we've had some wings, we've had some legs, we've had a crown. Oh, let's have some eyes now. Let's have three eyes. And now we're going to do the really difficult bit. I'd like you to show me your picture. So what that means is I want to show you, want you to show me and everyone else what you've drawn. If we were in a classroom, then you would just, of course, hold it up. You would show it to your friends. So that means you're all going to have to do what we said you shouldn't do, which is take, a, is to put your camera on and show me your crazy character. And let's see what we've got. Come on, be brave. Ooh, let's see. Oh, now I really like Dale's. Dale, why is yours not like Susie's? And Marie, Mauricio, yours is not at all like Janet's. Goodness me, can you all have a look at everyone else's? And can you, can you work out why you've all created such different crazy characters? And in fact, somebody, now here we actually need someone to be brave. Can you actually unmute yourself and tell me why or why you've not drawn the same thing? Jane? Yes, Mauricio. I think we should all be grateful uh, because we almost everyone put the eyes in the head, but not everyone. <laughs> and, and I think we no, should no. all be grateful. <laughs> I think Sarah has put eyes in all sorts of different places. She's got yeah. the chest. I like how it's on the you, chest as well. You, you didn't mention a head. So I, I didn't to, mention. I put the crown in the tummy. <laughs> so, so can someone tell me how I could improve what I did? Come on, somebody. You've got to imagine you're a five-year-old now. So, <laughs> what would you, what could you, what would you say to your teacher to help them improve the in, the instructions, the algorithm? We'd want a more precise instruction. Brilliant precision, and that's exactly what this lesson plan is all about. It's all about increasing precision. And I don't know if you noticed as well. I kind of started to drop in the term algorithm. So I'm now going to semantic profile the lesson plan. So you can now turn yourselves off again, which is quite sad because it was lovely to see you all. And can someone give me a thumbs up to say they can still see my screen? Because I've spent far too much time on Zoom with people not being able to see my screen. So this is our very first, so that's myself and Paul working with um, Carl. This is our very first semantic profile and I feel quite excited about it. Um, and it took us a long time just to get these little steps as we're kind of understanding the process. And in fact, I don't think I said at the beginning, so I should have said, explain you're going to use a new word and can you listen out for that so ugh, in the enactment of the lesson I got too excited and I didn't do that but I did share with you the learning intention so at this point we're very high on the semantic profile because I'm using quite technical words I use the word algorithm quite early on and most five-year-olds will not have heard that term and I was using it, it in not within a context but then um, as you can see I kind of bungee jumped down so there's kind of the sudden drop of talking at a very um, high level, level conceptual um, way of thinking about the world to suddenly be talking about instructions and drawing a crazy character. So whether I really connected our learning at that point in terms of the of the of the drop in the profile, I'm not sure. I then carried out the steps, and you started to. Um, 
uh, kind of add the, the different details. And I completely ignored Carl and didn't help him in terms of his very sensible question about trying to get more detail, because really what I wanted to do was I wanted to then say, I didn't expect what you'd drawn. So I used what Carl called counter expectancy in order to start to question um, how those um, people's understanding about this term algorithm which I've kind of introduced right at the beginning but then I started to use more frequently at the end of that little section and I asked how you could change that so now I'm actually trying to get you to start to repack rather than myself to repack as we start to do a staged um, return and I didn't actually get to the end but I kind of started to say that an algorithm is this idea it's it's a precise and I can't remember the person who said it but it's this idea of a precise set of instructions which that if everybody follows very carefully and to the to the absolute kind of detail then we'll all get the same output and that's it so that's the kind of um the crazy character the 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 beginning part of it and what we um what we profiled and as I say I can kind of show you I don't know if you see me again that's kind of in this little booklet and thousands upon thousands upon thousands of pupils and teachers probably more than that hundreds of thousands of them are kind of doing crazy characters and we were wondering whether um, I'm going to go back we were wondering whether because we actually do have um, some kind of uh, kind of a u-shape whether that might be one of the reasons why the lesson plan is, well, the lesson is very popular, but we don't know. So we need to do more research to find out that if we didn't follow that same uh, semantic profile, if the lesson plan would be um, less effective, but that's crazy characters. Um, and I'm now gonna pass back to Paul, who's gonna talk about our next bit of research and how we took this the next step on. So, Paul, I'm going to stop sharing and I think you can start to share. Okay, so hopefully you can now see my screen again. So, that was just a very concrete example of, oh, it seems to work, you, you know, it does fit this idea of what we think a good unplugged lesson kind of looks like um, and applying it in sort of a lot of detail plotting semantic gravity and semantic density how technical things are how the sort of complexity of of the concepts the concept concepts complexity of the language and so on and how everyday things are and how context dependent they are thinking about that does seem to map to what we're doing with unplugged computing one of the things we then moved on to thinking about is but can it actually tell us how to improve lesson plans and it, if we look at some of our existing lesson plans that the ones i've been doing i've been doing these things in different forms for years if i take one of those could i actually see ways to improve it by properly thinking about lessons but we also wanted to come up with a way that would be really easy for teachers to just take pick up and follow because i've been giving these talks to teachers just saying okay this you know you plot curves like this this is this is what happens and then reflect on it and think about um whether what you're doing is a wave um but could we do a bit more than that to help people um and give them a sort of almost method it's not really a very technical method but to give them a way of seeing how to improve things so what we did was we decided okay getting people to draw profiles seems to to be good so can we get them to draw profiles but then can we just come up with a couple of questions that are the things we found really useful to think about that we could give to teachers and so i then basically took this method and applied it to mine so in more detail so what we say, said was we're not trying to draw really detailed profiles it, it's not 
you know the minute by minute it's just very rough profiles and we don't care how far up and down you're moving when you're making shifts up and down a wave we just care is it going up or is it going down at this point um, so you get very rough sketches of the semantic profiles in this way um, and doing that how does does that help um, and then I'll come to questions in a moment. Um, so essentially, and actually somebody was asking this in the chat, say a little bit more about density and gravity and so on. Well, I won't talk about the terminology, but essentially there's two separate things you're thinking about. How concrete and tangible are the things you're doing? So are you giving examples? Are you, and they might be technical examples or they might be everyday examples, but are you giving concrete examples and context are you making things very physically tangible or are they still sort of just ideas and so that's one thing so you could be uh, making things more concrete more tangible and that would be you're going down in the semantic profile you could also be giving simpler meanings so you know like that while concept the while concept itself is a very very dense meaning but it's actually just about repeating things. That's a simpler meaning, and it's a simpler meaning in everyday language. So if you're going, going to more simpler things, then you, you're going down, you're lowering the profile. If, on oh, the other hand... Oh, can, I, can I just jump in quickly? Yep, correct um, me. <laughs> so I, uh, I'm uh, Yusuf from South Africa over here. Um, you say focus on relative shifts. Now, is that yes. shifts relative to the knowledge that's just been covered or relative to the audience and the speaker level? Uh, that's relative to what you just or did. So, well, the, there's probably a bit okay. of both, but we're, we're assuming that when I'm saying that, we're looking at the last step and now, now are we going lower or higher than the last step we just did? is really what we're getting people to focus on in the background of that you do have to think about what the background of your people are so if you're giving an everyday example that's a cultural reference that works in england and it doesn't remotely work in in japan because they don't th have that example then you wouldn't be making a move for those people um you wouldn't be lowering things because it's not every day for them so you have to think to some extent about the context and especially you know international concept contexts make this very difficult to know exactly what they do know and don't know and likewise generational shifts i i use lots of examples that date back to me as a teenager that people don't know about anymore and i use a lot of things like well pick up a dictionary and think about how a dictionary works or 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 how an index in a book and kids today have never seen a book so how on earth do they know how an index works you know so things like that you do have to think about you may think you're lowering the profile and you're lowering the profile for you but you're not lowering the profile for your particular students so that is something to think about Great, okay so high high making the profile higher sort of making your curve go back up again is when you're thinking about something that's more abstract you know it's not grounded in the world and in examples or you're switching to more complex meanings which quite often means just you're, you're going back into technical language and you might think you're using a word that is an everyday word but actually it is technical or it has different meanings for the people my favorite one of this is i work a lot with across disciplines with people from other disciplines and if i say the word model then I mean a very definite thing. And it turns out that a social scientist means something that clearly is not a model. You know, they have a completely different meaning for that. Um, semantics actually is a good one. You all probably think of semantics as being a very clear term. You are wrong. It is not what you think it is. Semantics is about maths. So if you're not writing maths in higher order logic, you're not really talking about semantics. So you have these problems that, you know, things that, you think are every day because you're so used to using them actually are very technical and somebody else might have a completely different technical meaning that they think you're meaning um so you have to be a bit wary of that kind of thing when you jump across cultures and crossing disciplines is a way that you get these problems where you think uh, people know what you're talking about and they don't anyway so that is all about drawing the curve so take your lesson plan look at each major step in the lesson plan and just 
think about are you going up or down i'll give you examples as we go along anyway but james was already as an example of that each step was a, a shift either up or down at the beginning the sh shifts were going down because they were getting more concrete and more tangible you were actually doing a physical drawing in the real world it was every day we were talking not about algorithms but about um, drawing things and how specific the instructions were so that's lowering the profile and then when you move back up and start talking about well what we're dealing with is an algorithm you're getting into technical language and we're thinking about more abstract things so at that point both higher the profile again so we then added to this some specific questions to just make people focus a bit more rather than just say now reflect which is what i was doing originally um, so there's basically we wanted to keep this really simple so there's just three questions and they're trying to be really simple about what you're thinking so the first thing is what shape is it does it follow a rough wave shape is it u-shaped or n-shaped now whenever i do this to teachers and or computer science academics they always say but why are you using u-shapes i was always taught to do n-shape you know we start with an example and then we go from there to the the theoretical concept and why on earth are you saying showing me a u shape when clearly an n shape is better so this is the thing that actually I mean, carl's typed in answer to a question in the google doc that actually there are lots of different shapes and lots of different shapes work for different people in different ways so it's not necessarily a right and wrong profile but if it does follow a rough wave shape then you're probably on the right track if it doesn't you ought to be thinking about what you're doing and whether it works the way you want it to a second question this came from jim actually correcting something of mine for ages i've been using some examples to teach my undergraduates and master students how to write explanations and i gave a concrete example of what i said was a good explanation and it followed a very simple wave and i was sort of giving them a, a picture of the wave to sort of give them a visualization of what i thought i was doing and jim pointed out actually my semantic profile didn't go all the way back to the top so i i started with an abstract concept i took them into a concrete example and then i only went halfway back up towards the original thing i'd started with and i hadn't noticed that at all um, so just thinking about this question helps you think about are you really taking people deep down and are you taking them all the way back up to the thing you're really trying to to teach them and thinking about how far down you go is useful as well because one of the things i'm interested in is, is and i've been thinking a bit about is that there are actual layers in the things i do so when we go physical that's going really concrete and tangible but you can do the same thing at a level higher where you don't actually do an unplugged demonstration you just talk about metaphors and talking about metaphors is slightly higher than actually acting out the metaphor um, so thinking about could i go further down could i act this out could i make this physical is a useful thing when you're thinking about unplugged kinds of things or just metaphorical teaching and then the last one jane was the one who really really made me focus about this and i hadn't thought about this at all is who is doing the packing and unpacking is it you the teacher that's packing and unpacking things are you making the moves up and down or are the students because you, if you're doing it the students could be staring into space and not actually going with you um, you know whether they're focusing or not so if you're getting them explicitly to do the packing and unpacking that's better okay to make this a bit more concrete what we thought we'd do is actually go through one of the activities this is the sort of thing i've been doing with teachers so actually do an unplugged activity i'm going to do a really quick and simple one just so we don't spend a lot of time on this there's a series that i've done this with and what i've been doing is sort of auto ethnography whenever i've done a talk that's include unplugged whether i'm doing it online or physically with people i've been thinking in advance about the semantic profile of my lesson plan so two that we've done that we've just put in a paper uh, that's going to be presented uh next month or yeah next month um followed two one teleporting robots which is a magic trick and one box variables which is a physical role play where we get kids acting out what a program's doing acting out computation so i'm going to focus on the first one 
Um, and if there's time at the end, I'll say a little bit about the second one. I, I've probably given one of the questions I, somebody's asked. I will actually quickly give an overview of that before I hand back to Jane. Anyway, so I'm going to do an activity. It's the unplugged activity teleporting robot. Normally I'd be doing this physically, but I do have to do physical things online now. So I'm going to do the online version of this. So while we're doing this, just to keep you active, I want you to draw the semantic profile from the next slide onwards of what I do. So you may agree and draw the same semantic profile as I do, or you may draw something completely different, but that would be quite interesting to know anyway. So whether you do this on paper or in a drawing package on your computer, if you are able to easily add it to the Google Doc by taking a picture of it or just saving it as a JPEG or whatever and dragging it into the Google Doc, that will be a way we can sort of share and see if people do draw the same version of it as I do. And if you're new to this, this will just give you a, a practical example of thinking about what a semantic profile is about and hopefully get you a little bit more into LCT. Anyway, so the activity. So start drawing the profile from now. I'm now going to do the activity. So this is to some extent following on what Jane did, understanding what an algorithm is. So by the end, you should be able to explain the concept of an algorithm but I'm going to use a magic trick to actually illustrate this. So I'm going to, first of all, though, give you a very simple idea of what an algorithm is. It's basically just a set of instructions. So it, it's a special kind of instructions. It's not instructions like keep off the grass. It's a set of instructions that if you follow them step by step in the right order and do them exactly right, so you're following them precisely but you're also following them blindly you don't have to understand why you're doing the steps you don't have to understand exactly how the steps work or why they work but if you do that you should always get some guaranteed outcome that's what algorithms do they allow you to follow steps and and get some guaranteed outcome okay so if you wait a moment i'm going to actually try and do this physically by switching to my actual desktop so hope this is going to work. You should be able to see my hands in a moment. Okay, so hopefully you can now see my hands. Good, somebody's saying yes. So what I've got here is a physical jigsaw. Okay, it's a really simple thing. You, you can count along with me. Normally I'd get the whole class just counting in synchrony here, but this is a very special jigsaw. It's got some very magical, very intelligent robots in it. So it's just six pictures six pieces that form into a jigsaw pattern and if you put the pieces together then you can see the picture. So what I want you to do with me is count how many robots there are in this picture. So I will count them, you can mentally count along or count out loud, but how many robots? There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. There are 17 robots. There is actually a robot dog I didn't count up. And there's also four green monsters, but they aren't robots. So we've got 17 robots in this jigsaw. Now, the interesting thing about robots and giving them artificial intelligence, they tend to gain some creativity and, and a sense of fun as well. And we've got one joker of a robot here who likes to play tricks on us. So if I take this jigsaw and actually mix it up and give this robot a chance to do its thing, what we find when I put the jigsaw together, so find the pieces now, okay, so the way I remember this is there's a robot with a pink skirt in the middle at the bottom, and then green monsters, green monsters go at the top, and then you fit the rest in in between. So if I put the the jigsaw back together. It's all the same pieces, I'm just putting them back together again. But you can hopefully see the whole thing there. Actually, I've drifted off. Tell me if things drift away. Okay, so there were how many robots? There were 17 robots, and we've got the 17. same 17, the same pieces, but let's count them together again. 
There were 17, now there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. One of the robots just disappeared. So the question is, which robot disappeared and how on earth did it do it? Was it eaten by a green monster? Has it teleported away? Is it just hiding somewhere? At this point, people always want to know what's on the other side of this. Well, actually, they're all just blank. Um, so it definitely didn't go onto the other side. Um, so how on earth did that happen? And actually, I can bring him back again. So let me just shuffle the pieces up and put the For pieces those who, back. For uh, those who were in, in England during the 1980s or the UK in the 1980s, I'd say it was the, uh, the robots that make Smash. <laughs> yes. it. which is probably I drew this picture and this jigsaw and probably there was a lot of the smash robot going into um, my design of some of the robots I've drawn here but yes okay so I've put the jigsaw back together again the robot had a chance to reappear so let's count there were 17 then there were 16 now there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 14, 15, 16, 17 he's back again so your job is which robot disappeared and how on earth did that happen? Now, what we want you to do is do this trick yourself. So if you did take this PDF and print it out and cut out the pieces, you can physically do it like I did. If you didn't do that because you don't have a printer, that's okay. I'm going to show you an online version and you can stay with the online version in a minute. Let me just show you what I did. This doesn't actually explain anything, but to do this trick, what you do is you build the jigsaw with the small pieces over here and line everything up. You count the robots like I did and then what you do, you mix them up, but what you're actually doing is just swapping the top two pieces over. This jigsaw just fits together in two different ways and so you put the build it back the second time with the small pieces over here and if you do that you find that one of the robots disappeared. So that's basically what you're doing. You build it again, this second way with small pieces over there. You then count the robots and you'll find one of them's disappeared. Of course, it's still the same pieces. There's still the same physical pieces here. There's the same number of heads, the same number of bodies. So that doesn't explain anything at all. You could do that in front of people. And I do this quite often. You just swap the pieces over and still it doesn't explain. It's still magical. There's still a robot appearing and disappearing. So I'll give you a few minutes to actually try that if you have got a physical version there to play around with that you've cut out. Um, let me just switch screens again. Um, and I'll go back to my slides so I can show you the online version and let you stay at that. Um, but so activity now I just want you to try and do this whether you're doing it watching on screen to do the trick what I just said there's basically five steps build the jigsaw with the smaller pieces on on the left count the robots remember how many they are mix up the pieces rebuild the jigsaw with the smaller pieces over on the other side just the top two layers the bottom layer stays exactly the same and then count the robots and you'll find a robots disappeared I'll give you a few minutes to do that and then you can spend the rest of the talk wondering how on earth it happens. What I can do is actually play the online version of it. So you can count the robots, move them about and you can see them moving. And this should just repeat and you can watch this if you haven't got a physical version and pretend you're actually moving the pieces. So you're doing it yourself and you can kind of do the patter talk to people, count the robots and so on as you're doing it. Pretend you are the magician, you can do this trick whether physically or with this interactive version. I will just shut up for a couple of minutes and let you do that. And if you want to type any questions in the Google Doc or in the chat, feel free to do that. There are questions that are in the Google Doc that several people have been answering already. So you may want to have a look at that at some point but I'll be quiet for two minutes. This is very strange. 
It's magic. <laughs> and you can do the magic. That's the wonderful thing. Okay, I'll give you 30 seconds or so more to think about this. Remember, you're trying to identify as well which robot is disappearing. You can always, if you think it's a particular robot, put your finger on that robot, move the pieces around and see if that robot is still there. You'd probably find they're just swapping their bits. They're good recycling, environmentally friendly robots. They just swap their bits for, with other robots all the time. But if you think you've found the one that's disappearing, put your finger on it and you'll find it's either gone or it's still there. But how could it disappear? It's a physical jigsaw, just moving pieces around in front of you. Clearly can't make something disappear. Anyway, I don't want to spend too much time on this. You can spend the rest of your life staring at this and trying to work out how it works. Let me... talk a little bit about it and the lesson from it. So what is this to a magician? There's a whole bunch of magic tricks that magicians call self-working tricks. Oh, and one thing I should say, and I usually say when we do, we do whole magic shows for kids where it's all magic, but it's all computer science as well. And we teach two hours of computer science by doing magic tricks. And we always say at the start, if you work out how the trick works, don't shout it out, don't spoil it for others, but also, uh, if you do do the trick for, for somebody else, don't give the secret away once you've worked out the secret. Of course, you may never work out the secret, but the point is you can still do this trick. And that's what self-working tricks are about. Whether you know how they work or not, you can do the steps and the trick will be magical. So you can be a magician without having a clue how the magic works. Follow the steps in the right order and it just works. That's a self-working trick. And it works even if you have no idea what you're doing. Now, computer scientists call exactly that concept an algorithm. An algorithm is just a set of precise steps that if you follow, guarantee some result. And that's what we're happening here. The result we're guaranteeing is a magical effect. I wrote it in English, the instructions for a human to follow. When we're writing algorithms, we tend to write them in a language for computers to follow. Um, and that's what programming is all about, just writing algorithms in programming languages, writing them in a particular language that's very, very precise. And the reason for that is English isn't very precise. And you, you know, I said in my instructions, swap the pieces over, but I didn't remember to say, oh, but don't swap the bottom layer over um, in my written instructions. And you, you can just easily forget steps. And what we need for it really to be an algorithm is it's very, very precise that anybody can follow it and they are guaranteed by following the instructions to get it right. So recipes are a similar thing, but the trouble with recipes, they're always a bit vague, which is why I always burn cakes because I never get it exactly right. So algorithms are about follow them, you'll get it exactly right every time. So, you know, this is what magic's all about. It's about following steps and magical things happening. Programs are the same sort of idea. I wrote it in English for a human to follow. Programming is about writing algorithms in a form that a computer can follow. And why does this matter? It matters because computers have no idea what they're doing. They don't have any intelligence. All they can do is blindly follow instructions that they're given. And so that's precisely what we need. We need computers to have very precise self-working tricks for everything they do. Everything you've ever seen a computer do, it was just following steps that some programmer spelt out for it to follow, but it has no idea what it's doing because it isn't conscious. So how could it have an idea what it's doing? So just like I programmed you by giving you the steps and now you can do the magic trick, I program computers so they can do everything that I want them to do. So the real difference is, algorithms for computers in a computer science sense are written in a very precise language but they always have to work you have to second guess everything that could go wrong and make sure you have every instruction there okay so what i want you to do now i'll, I'll only give you a minute to do this because we're running a little bit late but very quickly if you go to activity three if i got this right um 
sorry, activity two, I got them my numbering wrong. So activity two, there's a series of bullet points. Just write a sentence about what you think an algorithm is based in the instruction, um, based, based on the presentation I just gave. You've got precisely a minute to do this, so you better be quick um, and just help you reinforce what an algorithm actually is. And then I'll just very quickly summarize what an algorithm is and then we'll move on and think about it. And this is still part of the activity that as a whole that you're drawing the semantic wave of what I'm doing for. So I'm still in computer science mode at this point. This is my lesson and you're still in my lesson, hopefully following a wave. Of course, if you don't like typing things and sticking your head above water, you could just be reading other people's instructions that they're writing into the Google Doc and thinking whether you agree with them or whether they've missed something that matters. So a few people are joining in here. Okay, so and you've got about... Apology to, to, to those people in China who can't access the Google Doc. Um, yes. Is there another way that we could get it to them? Uh, you, you, so we will find, we will turn this whole Google Doc into a PDF or something and we can email it around to everybody afterwards. If okay. people want to, they could type their description in the chat, which I meant to say and then forgot. Sorry. Um, but I'll give you an overview of what an algorithm is in a moment anyway. And you don't have to type it into the Google Doc. You could be just writing this down on paper in front of you. What I'm trying to do is make you be active. Don't be passive when you're learning. Have a go at doing it. And writing is a good way of bringing things sort of out to the fore and working out whether you really understood what just went on. Anyway, your time's basically up. You can carry on typing if you want to, but I don't want to spend a lot of time. I'd, I'd give people a lot more time than this if it was an actual lesson. But what is an algorithm? Let me summarize it. It's precise instructions. That's the first thing. Precise instructions of if, how to do something very specific. If you follow them exactly and in the precise order given, then you should guarantee to do something, whether it's work out what a multiplication of two big numbers is, or if it's um, exactly the, the instructions to bake a cake, if it's an algorithm, you should guarantee to get the right result by following those instructions. If it's a magic trick, you should leave everybody going wow, and they should think something magical just happened. I haven't mentioned this term, but there's an idea of a computational agent coming. The, the thing or person following the instructions blindly is what we call a computational agent. Computational agents don't use any intelligence, they just blindly follow instructions. So computers are computational agents, but people can act as computational agents as well. And they do it without any understanding of what they're doing or why. So even though you probably still don't know how this trick works, you can for the rest of your life do this trick just by following the instructions and people will go wow and they will think something magical has happened. And that's an important point. And that's why magic tricks like this are really a good way of illustrating this. How on earth can you do a magic trick and not know how it works? That's just slightly strange because surely you need to understand magic to be able to do magic. Well, no, you don't. If it's an algorithmic magic, if it's a self-working trick, you don't have to understand. It's all about following instructions. And programming is all about following instructions. Computers working are all about following instructions. The result is obtained whether you know what you're doing or not. Okay, and that's the point where I end the activity. So if you've been drawing a semantic profile of this, then have a think about the semantic profile. And down in activity three, I'll put a big page. You might want to try and stick things in there if you've got a way of easily cutting and pasting what you think I've been doing. Um, we can have a look at those as people add them if they do, but I will now talk through what I think the semantic wave of what I was doing is. Oh, and if you're sketching the 
profile quickly now than these were the instructions I went through. So in terms of the steps of you're asking, did I go up or down? I introduced the outcome. I explained what an algorithm is. I did the trick. I gave you instructions to do the trick. I explained the link to self-working tricks and algorithms. I explained the link from algorithms to programs. I sum so you summarized the algorithm and then I summarized the algorithm. Those are essentially the steps we went through. So what I think I just did, I haven't followed exactly that numbering, um, and I'll tell you why in a moment, but I drew the profile as looking something like this. So I started with the learning outcome, talking about algorithms. That's up in the clouds. That's a word you've never heard before, perhaps. I linked it very briefly and said, I'm going to use a trick to help understand this. So at that point, I wasn't really doing any kind of platform because I just mentioned it in passing, but I'm, I'm passing through a point going downwards. I then gave a simple explanation of algorithm. So I'm now giving it in more everyday language. I'm trying to give, unpack the concepts into sub-concepts. And so I've somehow gone down a step. And then I'm going down really, really low. I'm actually doing a physical version of the trick. So I'm now as low as I go doing physical things but it's all about magic it's not about computing it's not about anything other than magic apparently and then you do the trick so this is giving you a chance to unpack and if you've thought about that what i said an algorithm was you might be starting to realize you're doing something a bit algorithmic because you're doing the trick you may not but you're now sort of starting to repack things you're giving getting a chance to sort of make the links back upwards. I then start making specific links. I'm still in the world of magic talking about self-working tricks, but then I make a link from that to algorithms. So I'm sort of starting to make a link upwards. I'm then making a, a link upwards again. I've moved out of the world of magic and I'm in the world of computer science talking about algorithms and programs now, but still within this context of what we just did. So it's still, uh, every day and I'm trying to give a, a general introduction not a technical introduction when you explain you're actually then trying to draw links so you're moving up a level again and then I go back and I give the the more um, technical definition start using some more technical words and I actually start doing little ups and downs here it's not a flat platform really and none of these are really flat actually a lot of them are just zigzagging up and down in the platform. Okay, so that's roughly what I was trying to do anyway, whether I managed to do it or not. Um, I then followed, well, before I did this, not today, but a couple of months ago when I last did this presentation, I actually started with a lesson plan that was slightly different. It was a lot simpler. Um, so there weren't as many platforms along the way and it was all me doing things and that's what i planned to do and i drew this semantic wave and i thought asking those three questions and especially um the ones about you know what the wave is and where the packing and unpacking is and who's doing the unpacking actually i can do better than that so the, the version i did originally has this very sharp cliff edge drop and so i started you know, can I do something to ease that? Can I make this going back upwards a bit more? And can I put in some things where students are doing things? So what I actually did in the presentation a couple of months ago is I actually added in a step where you do the trick instead of me just doing the trick and then talking about it, I gave you the chance to do the trick. And then I also added in this, instead of me just summarizing at the end and doing all the repacking, I added this step of, why don't you have a go at explaining algorithm, then you can start to do some repacking. When I did that actual presentation, I actually, Jane did the same thing just now. Um, I actually skipped some slides and I, in the, my rush to do it, I almost forgot to do the bit at the beginning of explain uh, what the learning outcome was. And so I very nearly did a pattern like this where I start at the bottom, I just went straight into the trick. I didn't say anything about the technical language. And I don't think that would have worked quite as well, because at least if I've said about algorithms at the beginning, then you, you're slightly prepared when I start talking about it later. 
you understand why I'm doing it. If I do it like this, you spend the first part of the session wondering why on earth are we doing magic? What's this got to do with computer science? I paid to learn about computer science, not to learn to be a magician. So I think it helps if you just do at least the cliff edge. But actually, after the presentation, I reflected a bit more about the fact that I missed, met, almost mucked that up. And I thought, well, actually, I can give this explanation of an algorithm at the beginning. And if I do that, when they learners doing the tricks, when you're actually doing this, you can actually start to link back. So that's what I actually ended up with and what I tried to do just now. And so essentially by thinking about semantic profile and thinking about those three questions, actually it did help even though i've done the, this teleporting robot trick zillions of times by thinking about the semantic wave and those three questions it did actually on the morning of the talk help me improve it so I, it was quick and very easy i did actually do it just on the morning of the talk you know as i was going through my slides i sort of sketched the the semantic profile as i went along and, and i thought oh yeah actually i can do better because of thinking about those questions and thinking about the profile. So I did find clear ways to improve the lesson plan, thinking about unpacking and repacking and adding the learner rather than the teacher activity. Other points that come up about this is, and Jane will talk about this, I'm eating into her time, looking at the time, I'd better stop. Um, so I'll pass over to Jane. I'll just throw up, because we won't have time to think about it in more detail. The other activity I did has a profile like this. There's lots of waves within waves. In this one I'm doing physical role play which is very down at the bottom of physical and I'm also zigging backwards and forwards to a concrete example that's a technical example of a program which is higher up because it's very technical but I'm going from technical to role play to technical to role play and that kind of wave within wave gives a really powerful way of doing unplugged. At that point, I'll hand back to Jane because we wanted to do some discussion and I've just seen I'm eating way too much into discussion time. So I will stop sharing and let Jane take over. Oh, hello. I don't think I'm going to do what we plan to do because I'd really like us more to talk about what's happened and um, to kind of get some discussion going, particularly because I'm aware that some of you are not able to access the Google Doc. And so therefore, you've not been able to see the discussions that have been occurring there. Um, so um, we've got, Carl, is it right that we finish at half past? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And um, I think it, um, it's a really interesting moment to think about things like um, what Paul was saying about using this as um, a kind of like a kind of um, a sort of critical reflection tool, as it were. I mean, or perhaps also a design tool, because, you know, you're not just reflection, but actually then redesigning the pedagogy. Is that what you're thinking of now moving on to discussing? Well, we had planned I'll in talking. Question. Yes, we go to about yeah, yeah. Half. yeah, we had planned in talking about um, different approaches for packing and unpacking. So, kind of looking in more detail at um, how different uh, people from different communities and different contexts are kind uh, are linking between either the um technical vocabulary and the everyday language or between um a, a general non-context dependent um part of the lesson and a very context specific part of the lesson um or we or we could just uh, kind of reflect on some of the discussions that have been happening in the google doc um has anyone got any preference? Do we want to talk about methods to pack and unpack, or do we want do would we would you like us to quickly show the people in China who've not seen the discussions, the Google Doc, if you see what I mean? Uh, any views? There are, some, there are some questions in the chat, so we could try and answer questions in the chat and open those up for discussion. Or, um, pe or people just bail in. If somebody wants to say something either about unpacking, repacking, using it as reflection, why not just pile in and, and say what you want to say or type something about it in the chat window? 
and I'd like oh. to hear Sarah's too because I've been talking to Sarah by typing to her so I'd like to hear her voice. <laughs> G'day. <laughs> Sarah, hello. <laughs> Hi. How are you going? I have to rush off Hi. but um, Jane and I have been having a lovely chat on Google Docs. We've been comparing um, semantic profiling and um, it's been really interesting because I think what you're doing is mirroring what I'm doing, but where our contexts are quite different. I think the thing that we both have in common is that we're talking about teaching and how to unpack that, that mystery of pedagogy. I think that's really helpful. So, um, yeah, so I think it's going to be an ongoing conversation. Yeah, so Paul, what's amazing is that whilst you were doing the activity, Sarah very quickly started to draw the semantic profile in detail, and that's on the Google Doc. So it, it'd be really interesting to compare Sarah's one. It's on page eight, um, and I'm going to share my screen so that people who can't see the Google Doc can see it. So this is Sarah quickly... Um, can you see my screen? Someone give me yep. a thumbs up. Yeah. So Sarah very quickly drew the profile. But what I was really excited about was how she took fragments of text and um, underneath the profile was using these little up arrows and down arrows or zeros with different colours in order to show the up and down, which I thought was a really nice way to quickly do that um one, but it does go on paul i was just going to say one of the interesting things um, what i'm trying to do is sort of i draw these platforms and what i actually think when i look at the detail of the platform in each platform what makes it a platform is actually linking up and down up and down up and down which looks like is what you're drawing yeah. there lots of very fine detail so you know the actual very rough course version of this is doing something like that what i think i'm actually doing at each point is i'm going up and down up and down yeah like a seismic graph yeah and it's really definitely a very very detailed version of it i'm i'm definitely on a linguistic level sort of sentence by sentence I, i'd agree definitely doing this kind of up and down up and down up and down and that is a bit more what on a bigger level the the other activity that i just flashed up the thing was doing is is very a lot of going backwards and forwards and i kind of think that that is actually the key to really keeping the learners with you is is actually not doing it in a set of stages that the course version of is doing but in each of those stages you're linking not necessarily all the way to the top to the next place you're going or to the one you just came from um, yeah. So the thing that um, this this pr plotter does is um, is is really show the wave the wave range, but what it doesn't mm. do is the the non sequiturs the 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 segmentation that may may happen in the discourse. And I find that in new teachers, that's quite a common thing to do, and it's not mm. this plotter can't reflect that at the moment. Yeah. I think what you're, you're getting at is a really interesting point in the sense that, um, I mean, like we can, we can think of profiling, if we're thinking of it practically, as like using a sort of map, you know, you, you might need a fairly big scale map to get you to where you want to go originally. So you want to get to say Sydney or, or Cape Town or wherever it might be from wherever you are, you need, you might need quite a big sort of level map, get to the country, get to the city, whatever it is. And then as you get a sense of where you are, you know, up, you know, the top and the middle of the bottom, for example, then you might need to sort of zoom in and start to see more complexity if you need to, you know, so, and then you can get further in and then you might see that actually it's a lot more complex than just simply kind of going there and then there and then there. It might be these little movements down and so on. So I think, I mean, um, you know, like, as I'm always saying about LCT, is, is you only need as much theory as the problem demands, and you only need a, you know, as approximate uh, 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 a representation as you find useful. And so, yeah, if you found that you then, if you zoom in, now you've got your basic profile, uh, Paul and Chain, if you may, you know, zoom in and think, ah, oh, it's useful for me to now know something that's happening inside something I've just written like that, but actually maybe doing something else, 
that's fine. I mean, where I get kind of frustrated is when people think it's about trying to draw a map as big as the country. So to try and draw every single detail that you can find for the sake of drawing it. And that's just, that's just, for me, that's just sort of fetishism. Um, you only need as much, you know, detail as you find useful. And yeah. some people say, oh, is it that simple? Is it, you know, it can't be just that profile. Well, it isn't that simple, but that's the level we need for now. Do you know what I mean? That's one of the things that I found. I mean, the very early sort of, when I didn't really know a lot about it, I just come across the idea and the curve of, and a wave being a good idea. I was teaching teachers, look, just think about at this very course level of make sure the overall lesson goes from top to bottom and don't worry about the steps in between, just think about the weight. And with teaching students to write, I'm basically just saying, explain the concept, give me an example, and then link the concept back to the example. And, and that's exactly this very coarse grain version of a wave. Then we've gone to this level, you know, and the teachers were help finding that useful just to tell them to think at the very coarse level, it's just a wave. And if you've got a wave structure, you're probably doing something good. And then the next level is say, well, try and do it at this heuristic level of having platforms. And that's a little bit more helpful. You know, once you've got, you've taken the idea of a wave, you can then get a bit more detailed if you want to spend the time and go a little bit more. And then you can go a bit more. And this is what we're saying now. You can even go down to a much finer level if you really now want to focus on tinkering with, you know, the specific little bit, you know, one, two minute section and try and make sure you get that right. You know, then you can go in deeper as well. So, uh, yeah, I, exactly I completely agree. I mean, it's all about making one step at a time and, and one, you know, kind of like progress over time. So, I mean, like, um, uh, one of the fields I've worked at, so, um, uh, Lee and I have been talk, uh, talking about community. Lee Vishnu and I have been talking about communities recently. And I know Steve Rowlett, who was here earlier on, has, um, has written about communities. So one of the communities I used to work in, that was a sort of predecessor community to LCT, was full of people who would destroy you, or try to, if you didn't get it exactly right to the minusculely microscopic step, you know, like of the analysis. Just completely to misunderstand that's theoretical fetishism to completely misunderstand the point which is you only need the theory to do a job and the first step is to get the you know teachers or yourself to a point of understanding some vague sense of moving up and down and then to try and figure out what kind of things work or don't and then kind of zero, zeroing in to see what further things may work inside stuff and then further and further until you've had enough or you've moved on or whatever it might be you know so, I mean, there is a bit of, there's no end to this and it's not about getting a perfect profile of something, which would just be, you know, like um, doing a kind of miniature, perfect little miniature picture of something for what purpose? I mean, uh, so yeah, I, I think it's, you know, interesting that people drew, may, may have drawn, drawn different kind of profiles um, and that you will, may draw different profiles over time, depending upon what you, what you find useful and what other people find useful as well. I mean, for God's sake, it's all started with me listening to some talk and, and just drawing this on a piece of paper up and down with my hand, you know? Um, and that's all I could, I just felt this, this snaky movement and that was it really. Um, and that helped me understand things as a starting point. So I'm very much a, a big fan of one step at a time. I, d I actually did a talk to one of our away days for our department. So this is about 80 odd academics, but also all the, technical staff and admin staff, everybody in the department was there. And one of the wonderful things about it was afterwards, lots of people were wandering around and every time they saw me, they would kind of, they would do waves at me. And, and you know, the way, just that physical thing of doing that actually is something that people found really useful because they took absolutely. that away and uh, that helped them to remember. Absolutely. So. Yeah, I'm just trying to remember, um, who was it? Oh gosh, um, oh. Damn it, I've just forgotten. Somebody told me, uh, somebody who does, um, oh, why has it gone out of my head? Um, Trish, Trish Weeks, Trish Weeks, uh, uh, who did a PhD um, at UNE, and uh, I spoke with her a few times. Anyway, she's done sort of a lot of um, work in schools, and she was getting schools, 
kids to put their hands up and middle and down. Um, uh, not just do the profile, but just levels. And they were also making sounds as well um, without her asking, sort of high and then middle and then low while they were doing it. And these sorts of things can actually be quite useful themselves. And what we can do if we wanted to get really kind of reflexive is that, you know, LCT is really good at understanding why LCT is good because, <laughs> because you can move it from incredibly complex levels of uh, abstraction and very, very complex um, equation. So uh, there's an equation that's the motif at, one of the, at the start of the semantic density chapter in Knowledge and Knowers. And it's a bit of a joke, really. It's just saying, look, how complex this can get, how difficult it can get. Um, but you can go right down from there, right up in the clouds to this. And that is really physical. And that is really concrete. And that is really helpful. So I think, you know, using as much or as little LCT as you find useful is really, really important. And I'll just stop talking now because I'm just talking. Yeah, I think we've run out of time. <laughs> we have. For once much. Once. I mean, let anyone else talk. Uh, if anybody else wants to say something or jump in or. I think there's been an, a kind of a general background discussion as well. Jennifer has just mentioned about the difference between the interpersonal, like the, the personal meanings. She's talked about the interpersonal meaning as well as the in, instead of the field meaning. So I think that's quite interesting. So there's lots of different ideas that people are kind of introducing. And apparently we've been going on an autonomy tour of site. Can I speak to that for a second? The thing yeah. that strikes me is that Paul just as much relaxed us by talking about something that's incredibly accessible, like a magic trick, as well as exemplifying the algorithm in the magic trick. So by calling it a magic trick, by not calling it an algorithm when it's that particular activity, you relax us, you set us down, we all listen, and then tune in. And I think that works an awful lot with kids in the classroom when you tell them silly stories that do relate. And this is also where the autonomy tour comes in because you would then tour into something that is apparently unrelated and then pull it all together and come back. Would you like to talk mm. to that? Um, I mean, the point about going to unrelated things and pulling it back. Actually, that's a very key thing that I do all the time. So one of the other things I do is I write a magazine called CS for Fun for schools that I mean, we send free copies, physical copies to schools in the UK. And I basically write computer science research up for kids in that. And that what you just described is exactly what I do in those articles that I start with something really weird like, um, I don't know, what's Madonna got to do with the way the internet works and, and take people on, start with something really wacky that just grabs your attention and then take you on a tour that in the middle of it, I'm explaining some key concept like how the internet works. And then at the end, sort of bring it back and link back to to what the question was at the beginning which seemed to be nothing about computer science whatsoever um so exactly what you're doing is i mean i haven't linked that specifically into lct particularly but uh, that kind of tour is key to an all sorts of things that i do not just magic tricks but in the writing and in a lot of the you know the activities that i do in lectures and and in uh, you know science festivals when we do things in science festivals that kind of thing it's it's exactly doing that of doing and it something lowers the tenor and therefore lowers the semantic density axiologically yeah i mean one one of the things i'm interested in as well is the physicalness as well and you know the, a lot of what we do it's not just that we talk about it as a magic trick. So I don't really know how this other people have probably thought about this a lot more than I have, but it really is key to what we're doing. It's the physicality, the tangibility is one of the things that makes Unplugged work. So it's not just talking about a magic trick. The fact that we physically do a magic trick makes a, a big difference in lots of ways. And it, the way I'm thinking about that is that is going a level deeper 
in this sort of tour away from computing and then you're bringing it back from the physical into the sort of more abstract domain and then back again so i don't know whether that's linked into that as well um but that's and something i think something it's really I'm fascinating i think you're going to have like you've got enough um i think you've got uh you paul and uh, jane you've got uh a kind of like a, i can see ahead a number of different things to explore here you know i mean i know that yeah. you're really interested in constellations and i can see also that your your teaching in this is involved one thing at a time don't overwhelm yourself um one thing at a time but i can see that as being a future uh, uh one of the things that uh, as Jennifer was pointing to, is that one of the reasons why this is so, so, so successful is the fact that you are moving out of your target and then transforming things, interjecting things, as we call it, and so on. But as I say, yes. you know, one thing at a time, um, and yes. semantics is proving very valuable for you at the moment. And I should, yes. I should wrap this up. Jane is uh, very good at keeping uh, tabs on the time, and I'm not. So, But I should... Um, I want to say, before everybody has to run off, and a number of people have already, but I just want to say thank you very much uh, Jane and Paul for um, for doing that and doing the first one as well, which is never easy start uh, to a session and um, uh, and particularly on Zoom, which is uh, particularly kind of and you've made it much more interactive with the Google Doc and we've had some chat on the chat on Zoom as well and I think you're going to save all this and put it somewhere is that or send it to the forum or something? So we've That's... already um, created a. Um a web page on teaching London computing which I will put in the chat so um, so as well as having the Google Doc we've got a web page on our, our our website which is specifically for this roundtable and we've put the um, presentations on there as PDFs we've put a link to this Google Doc and we've also put links to the resources that we have been creating over the last what it's only two years i think it's only two years since we've been doing this it's crazy um so and um, we've created quite a lot of different resources um so i think yeah if and if if anyone wants to kind of keep in touch with us please do we've put our twitter handles um in the uh in the table in the google doc um but obviously and would you, you be able to uh, would that. you be able to uh to, to send the link with that you know saying what is in it to the to the email forum and um, or to yeah. the centre, yeah. and we can put it. To, send it to the email forum. We can also put it on social media as well, so that people can have a look at that and have a bit of a digest or return to it afterwards as well. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Thanks so much. I know that doing Zoom is not easy, but the great thing is that we are reaching out across the world far better than we would have done on on face to face, and we're able to have people like yourself. So thank you also for getting up um, and doing this in the morning. I know it's morning for you guys. It's time for breakfast. Yeah, it's time it is. For I'm hungry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm not thank surprised. You. Well, I'll let you go. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for being here as well. And I hope to see you all in two weeks. Thank time. you, Carl. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, you Wait, really cool. and thank you, Paul, thank you, for bye. everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Paul, what I've done is I've taken a PDF of the Google Doc for those that can't access it, and then I'll put the PDF onto TLC as well. Right, okay, and we could put, save the chat and put that onto TLC. I've tried yeah. to put most anything that was in the chat, I've tried to put, apart from the just thanks and things, I've tried to put that as questions into the question section of the Google Doc. Oh, okay, that's probably a better way of doing it. Yeah, so if we yeah. just go through the chat at the end and just check. Yeah, you know, I think I've done them all. I'll yeah. keep the chat as well. I think I've got all of them. There's something about comedy that I didn't get. Oh, I, I saw that. It flashed by, but I thought that was really interesting. I wanted um, analysis. Part, of partly because I, I, I just I was a the chair of a PhD of somebody who was analysing comedy, and ha at a sort of fine level of people repeating it. And actually, I didn't think about the links here, but <laughs> it's sort of very definite. I can see 
it all work in the same kind of way. That was really interesting. Yeah, put that into the questions and comments. Brian Tweed um, was the name of the person who, uh, I don't know if he's still here, but I'd uh, probably gone, but he was the person who said he'd analyze some uh, comedy or, uh, um, and I'd be interested to see that because I'm always interested in things like unusual data or different kinds of uh, practices yeah. and comedy is my first love anyway, so. Yeah, well, the PhD I just looked at, it was Vanessa Pope and essentially what she did was go to the same uh, comedy, watch the same comedy routine and record it over and over again. So the same sequence of sketches 20 times over and look at the exact timing of when things happened and exactly what the comedian was doing the same and what they were doing differently and how they made things sort of appear spontaneous and how they kind of refined little bits as they went along. Um, that's really so, interesting to me because I did a kind of version of that without it being about research. Is that back in the late eighties, I collected all these tapes. So back then before the internet, it was all just people sending me tapes. So I'd contact people who, uh, I'd, I'd contact venues that I knew Bill Hicks had played at in the States or might've played at in the States and ask them if they had a copy from the desk, from the mixing desk, if they'd made one, if they had a mixing desk mm -hmm. and if they had a copy. And some of them would send me unsolicited, you know, like unsolicited, but out of nowhere, I'd get a cassette in the, in the mail and listen to loads and loads and loads of these um, bootleg tapes of uh, Bill Hicks, who, who basically did one or two uh, skits and one or two sessions a night and um, uh, throughout the year. It was incredibly hardworking. And it just taught me a lesson in how to sound spontaneous when none of it's spontaneous, because he was almost word for word not when he was drunk, but when he was yes. soberish, he was word for word. The sometimes they descended into absolute chaos, but he was yeah. at his best. He was word for word, identical, including pauses that sounded yes. seemed spontaneous, and the yes. pauses that seemed spontaneous were to me the most most magical aspect of it. And I thought, my God, I mean, I've never been able to achieve anything like that because you don't do the same talk. I mean, I've done some talks many times, but you don't do them often enough to be able to get that down. Um, but just, you know, that's a fantastic aspect of it. But I don't know about the waving. I'd be interested to see what the waving aspects of uh, stand-up comedy might be. Yeah. Do you think that they their frequency of wave is much higher so that it's really densely packed? Or do you think it's, their densely well, I don't know, but I mean, I'm, lower? I think, I think this is kind of like a, 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 a kind of like a, a a, well, a hole down which we could plunge and never come out because I, I'm <laughs> yeah. so fascinated by it. Because for me, for example, I have a really big, strong, but I have a very strong opinion on what is good comedy and what isn't. And for example, I find the highly segmented, well, not segmented, I find the highly horizontal dribble of Dylan Moran are now very tedious. Mm -hmm. Whereas once I'd listened to um, st uh, uh, Sean Hughes do a set that built and came back and came back and did a spiral and it made me so much happier than just standing on stage doing an you know like an hour break yes. another half an hour or whatever just stopping he built this story uh, and yeah. rapport in a way that was just so much better yeah. than say as Eddie Izzard or Dylan Moran and I just yeah. uh, so I, but that's a very strong opinion of cumulative <laughs> comedy as far as I'm concerned rather than a research opinion. So it's yeah. like, it's like a drift. Uh, it's not a drift, but uh, the, if you saw the wave, it would, oh, I don't know, I've got no idea. I don't idea. know what the waving would be. <laughs> That's why we'll have to see what Brian's done. Cause I don't know what the waving, as far as I'm concerned, it was probably like non-stop just flat. But I mean, I'd be interested to see if it was a spy, you know, like, I don't but know, I'd be interested to see it. There's definitely a way that a lot of comedians do build things what whether it's a wave in this exactly these terms but people build from one thing onto the next so they build up a story that they then leave you think but mm. actually they then come back to it and and they they rely on the fact that you understood the things that they told you earlier to then get a punchline out of something they do later um so there's something along those lines going on that's interesting but now, I once got had somebody, one of my students came up to me at, at the end of a lecture and said, do you like Eddie Izzard? And he, 
the odd thing about it is I've been watching Eddie Izzard videos the night before. And so he seemed to think that, that the way I was performing somehow reminded him of Eddie Izzard. So I've no idea what it was, but something I picked up from spending an evening just watching old Eddie Izzard videos. You didn't turn up to into... lecture in a dress or... or well, I uh, didn't, no, I, not that I noticed. And I don't think I had any high heels on at the time. So it, there was something that... Yeah, and I hadn't mentioned if you listen him to a all. comedian too much, then you can end up lecturing like them. That's uh, for me. That's what I, have. I, I will. Uh, it's like talking to someone with a Welsh accent. I'll start picking up the Welsh accent, and then I, mm. I'm worried that they're thinking I'm mocking them because I can't stop yes. myself from starting to pick you're it up. A, and it's you're thing. a chameleon. The, you're the, <laughs> pat, the pattern, just a leech. The pattern <laughs> of someone's um, delivery, the pattern of their rapport, the pattern of the way they do things. And if you don't watch out, if you stayed up all night watching somebody or something like, you know, for me, it used to be like having, when I was in the late, as I said, in the late eighties, uh, no, no, it wasn't late. It was the late, so it wasn't late eighties. It was the late nineties, the late nineties. Um, I would listen way too much to Bill Hicks. And then if I tried to teach to a supervision or something as a postgraduate, I would just, I would just be, you know, recreating a kind of Hicksian like sound and then, and, and putting way too many, <laughs> Really, 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 really nasty swear words, <laughs> in you know. Um, and if it's to, if I'd watch Blackadder two, for example, you just become really sort of sarcastic if you don't watch out, you know. And start singing little songs. Anyway, I, it's time yes, to go. You to should the go conference. off for breakfast. Thank you uh, for everything, and um, keep in touch. Yeah, yeah. We've got, cool. got our conference to do. Yes, that's next. So if, anyway, thank you for giving us the chance. To talk about oh, thank this. you for doing it. It's been excellent. It's really great to see practice. Mm. Any chance you give me to do magic in front of an audience? <laughs> yeah, I still haven't worked out how it works. I've got to figure that out at some point. Uh, well, if, yes. Invite me back and I'll show you how it Somehow works. Somehow a <laughs> robot gets turned from two into one in the you, combination. You, well, I couldn't see it because my eyes are no. all over the shop at the moment. Even when you know exactly what's happening, you can't see it, which is what's wonderful about this. Yeah, so that what you've just said is the first step towards understanding it, but you've, there's a whole bunch more you've got to yeah, sort of get your yeah. head around it. And, yeah. and actually saying, work out which robot is disappearing is intentionally to make people go off on the wrong track because it absolutely isn't one robot disappearing. Um, it's two combining, isn't it? Well, it's not even two combining, but you'll have to is think three? a bit more about it. Three turning into well, two or something. Well, next time we talk, is this guild? Is this guild <laughs> it's, knowledge? It's just is this, shrinking. This is well, it is. Guild. If you want me to, given there's only a few people here now, I could actually show I'm you gonna, something I'm that will tell you. Go on, go on, show me, show me. Let me switch back to my desktop. So those me. people who are still here, who may have just walked away from their computers and forgotten to, um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. I once, I was at recently at a department meeting and I walked away from my computer for quite a while and then realized I had to race back in order to be able to get out before the meeting ended. Um, so that I didn't look as if I, because <laughs> I wasn't there, I turned my thing off. Okay, so which one goes where? Okay, so the first thing to notice is the top four robots yeah. just move together. So they don't change yeah. at all. So they can't have anything to do with it. So you can actually throw the top two away and and they're just there to make it all a bit more complicated and interesting uh -huh. so four mash it works here smash. so you've got two four six eight ten twelve thirteen that one is definitely smash yeah kind of coming in but anyway two four six eight ten twelve thirteen i swap those pieces around and there's two four six eight ten twelve so it still works so the thing to look at so what happens in the original thing if you look at this guy he's got oh, no, no head. can you move it over a little bit oh, he's, sorry. He's yeah. There you go. yeah so he's got no top of head above the yeah i noticed grade. that yeah yeah so think about his length he gets taller he gets a new mm -hmm. little bit but where does that bit come from it comes from here so he loses a bit of head mm -hmm. and gains a bigger bit of head and gets taller so where mm -hmm. does that one come from? It comes from over here. So this one loses a bit of head. And what does it get? It gets a slightly bigger bit of head and gets taller. So what's happening? 
is it's not one, it's not two, it's not three, it's all of these robots are cycling and the cut is moving down through the body. So eventually it's dropping down through the levels of the body. So here it, the point is sort of way down at the knees. So you know what happens with that one is it's sort of losing body and gaining body. But eventually at the other end of the chain is, oops, which way around is it? At the other end of the chain is this one. This one's the exact opposite. It's all above the line with nothing below the line. So when that last one moves around, he also gets taller by getting some legs from somewhere else. But what he leaves behind is a gap because everything was above and below. So the first thing to realize about this, is it's about oh. conservation of height. I still so can't I can show you. It's, it's so okay. much more complicated than I thought. I thought it was just gonna be three turn into two. Exactly. Oh so let me show you a way that helps you follow it. Yeah. So I think of the robots as lines and them actually swapping with the one next to them rather than jumping over the other side. So the, the jigsaw is the way it is to make things jump from one side to the other to make it even harder to follow. So this is a very, very old mathematical puzzle version of it. How many lines are they? Exactly the same as the number of robots in that shorter version, but one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Thirteen robots, thirteen lines. How do I make a line disappear? All I have to do is move it along one, and now I've got two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. That's all the robots are doing. So look what happens. Taller this lines. one's got they all become taller. This one's got nothing and look above the line. Yeah. So it gets taller. This one gets taller as well. It swaps a small bit for a bigger bit, and the next one swaps a small bit for a bigger yeah, bit. Yeah, and, and the somehow one, the robots do that as well. So the robots are doing exactly that. They're just jumping from one side to the other. And the thing is, the last one, because there's nothing below the line here, this one, when it gets taller, leaves nothing behind wow. because it's not passing anything on. So all yeah, of them no, are just I get it. It's just, it's mind boggling. It is actually really yes, interesting. It is. And yeah, so the jigsaw version is just adding lots of complexity onto exactly that. All we're doing is what we were doing with the lines there, but we add an extra layer on the top to add some confusion. We make the robot swap with something over the other side of the jigsaw, not just next to it. The other thing to notice as well to make it more confusing is a lot, lot of the robots look very similar. And this, yeah, the blue. so I've particularly drawn it so that you've got a grey robot on one side, a grey robot on the other. You've got a smash like robot over here and mm. one like that over there. You've got one with a balloon here and one with a balloon over there. You've got square robots here and one over there. So they've, it's hard to see exactly what's going on because there's lots of similarity all over the place to help disguise the fact that things are actually swapping with something wow. there's also there's, lots that of is, that, that's and magic isn't it it's the oh, art yeah. of indirection yes so it's adding complex yeah so it's a form of distraction i've added lots into the jigsaw to to sort of distract from the thing that really happens and actually when i say which robot is disappearing that's distraction as well because i'm making not you focus on one robot no robot is disappearing and it's not one it's all of them and then and while you're thinking oh. about one my Your question would, would be how, I thought this was I... I thought watching uh, Tenet yesterday by uh, Christopher Nolan was bad enough now my brain is you know like how uh, do I like apply Tuesday. this to my Tuesday pieces I watched... uh, you don't yeah how, how do I add complexity by just moving things around <laughs> uh, you don't you just add confusion the interesting thing as well is this trick dates back to about I don't know 1600 1700 or something it's like three wow. or four hundred years old and if you look at the design of banknotes banknotes are designed to stop people doing this trick because back in the day in the whenever it was 1700s 1800s people started slicing up banknotes and sticking them back together in a different order because it was a way of basically ultimately taking 12 banknotes and turning, and turning them into 13. 13. so that you have amazing. to design banknotes to stop I did not know that. Wow, that's another thing I've learned. Well, I've so, got to shoot off. Thanks so much, Paul. Yes, Go and get some breakfast. Yes, I ought to. And find out what my son's doing. I'll uh, chat to you soon. Yeah, okay. Bye. Bye.